All right. Uh, so I guess uh, you can hear me right now. And uh, so welcome everyone to this uh, seminar session today. Uh, our speaker is uh, Jos van Ameren from the Free University of Amsterdam. He's a professor of urban economics over there. Uh, his um, research is um, most of the time, I'd say, is uh, uh, empirical. He's an econometrician and also the work that he's presenting uh, to us today is an, uh, an empirical work. And uh, there are two co-authors and one is uh, Christian Behrens and the other Kevin de Jong. And we are having this online session is actually uh, very nice because as far as I understand during this session, we do not only have the, the presenter, which is uh, Jos van Omeren, but also the co-authors uh, in the audience. Um, so that's uh, uh, thanks to the uh, technology. And uh, we have, but on the other hand, we do have a little bit of a te technological problem. And this is that yours can speak to us, but for whatever reason, he can't hear us. So uh, we have to communicate in a very special way, which means that if you are having a question, then please use the chat box uh, on the right, so there is this purple button on the on, at the bottom on the right, and then there is this little uh, balloon, and then you press there, and then there is the, the then you can uh, reach the chat box and communicate with us, um, and in particular with with yours, and uh, and then he will uh, respond uh, using his mic. So that's 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 the idea. Okay, uh, I don't want to be spending any more time. Uh, on the introduction, I will just uh, send a message to Jos that he so that he starts with his presentation. And uh, I'm really, you know, I, I'm we are having now 44 people attending the seminar, which is really great from uh, different places all over the world. So thank you very much. thank you very much for participating. And uh, yeah, so I will ask Jos to start his presentation. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot have not heard the introduction, but uh, I hope it were lovely words. And um, this is uh, the next, I think, 45 minutes. I will talk about um, um, airline research I'm doing together with uh, Christian uh, Behrens and uh, Herman de Jong. And it's about a frequent flyer program. I hope you enjoy. And as I said, I cannot hear anyone. But you can uh, uh, give comments, questions through chat. Um, I hope you do that. Okay, let's start. Okay, sorry about this. Okay, sorry about this. Just to have find the right buttons for me. This is also a new system. Okay. As you all know, uh, price discrimination is extremely common in the airline industry. I think it's a typical exa textbook example that uh, nobody pays almost the same price if you uh, enter a uh, if you if you buy a ticket. It's always embarrassing to ask the person next to you in the airplane how much he or she paid for the ticket because it's always different. So uh, price discrimination is essential to the airline industry. And this received rightly so a lot of attention in the literature. But you have also something like loyalty, you know, sticking to your choices. And loyalty programs are important in marketing and economics and then used in many industries, but also in the airline industry. And there they are called frequent flyer programs. Um, and this is a very sophisticated form of price discrimination. It creates switching costs and therefore other air barriers to entry. And what you want to have in the end as an airline, you want to create positive demand relative to, to your competitors. Okay. So now a little bit, how do loyalty programs work? I think all of you have uh, at least flown once in your life, I suppose, and, and you're interested in it, and many of you will also be a member of a loyalty program, maybe all of you. So, what do loyalty programs do? They give you miles, which allow you to get free flights. 
That's very, very simple. For example, if you fly from Amsterdam to Hong Kong, something uh, Akim has done frequently, and then they give you miles, and with these miles, you, you can get maybe a short flight. So maybe a couple of uh, long distance flights is enough to get one short uh, flight. Okay, another example. Let's suppose you fly regularly between Amsterdam and London. And then after about 20 flights, you get one free flight, enough to buy a ticket for London, Amsterdam. So in principle, that gives you a price reduction of, let's say, 5%. So after you have made this flight, or he made this flight to Amsterdam and Hong Kong, and he joins maybe, uh, I don't know, Air France KLM uh, program, then it's better for him to stay with the same airline because if he continues flying uh, with the same airline from Amsterdam to Hong Kong, actually um, he gets his free flight. So a, a loyalty program creates switching costs. In other words, people are more loyal. And you see, I put it in between uh, quotes, loyalty, because it's just actually, you know, more loyal, you just, it's more expensive to switch. But why do loyalty programs offer them different tire levels? For example, they offer you um, uh, 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 different levels, and these levels offer you different kinds of um, advantages, different kinds of benefits. The problem is, at least the problem for airlines, is that free flights do not, with emphasis on not, create switching costs for members who fly a lot, which I will call the real frequent flyers. Let's suppose you fly every week. Yeah, that's quite regular. Then if you get maybe after three, four, or maybe even 20 flights, you get a free flight, you can easily become a member of several programs because you make maybe 50 flights in a year. So you can easily become a member of two, three, or maybe four programs because you get your free flights anyway. So free flights works for um, um, persons who fly a little bit, maybe once a month or once every three months. But for people who work fly regularly, actually uh, free flights doesn't create switching costs. So there is no incentive to become a member of only one program. So what do tire levels do? They offer additional benefits to loyal members. So they give you lounge access, free upgrades, low luggage allowance, etc. And other ways of saying is that actually the compensation for flight or the, the costs are increased as a positive function of the number of, of, of your flight behavior. So a program will offer several tire levels to lock you in. Questions up to now? No, I don't hear anything, but I don't see any chats coming in, so this is probably familiar stuff. So, some questions and answers I would like to answer. Do members increase their demand in order to get a higher level? For example, you know you have the, the lowest level in your in, in a program. Then you think, wait a minute, if I fly a little bit more, then I get maybe gold or platinum or diamond, and I like to have these advantages. So one question is, do members really fly more in order to get this higher level? This is what we call an incentive effect. Why do we call it an incentive effect? It's not something you experience now, you benefit now, but it's what you want to have. It's an incentive effect. Okay. What is the answer? In short to our paper, yes, we find evidence of an incentive effect, but it's much stronger for members who fly a lot, or actually to get the highest, to get the highest tire levels. Another question is, if you have this tire level, in order to take advantage of the benefits, do you even fly more, which we call the consumption effect. So the incentive effect and the consumption effect are really something different. The consumption effect is, Okay, let's suppose I have platinum, which gives me all these advantages. The fact is, you only benefit from all these advantages if you fly. What's the use of a free lounge if you don't fly? What's the use of an upgrade if you don't fly? So the logic of this tells us that if you all like these uh, advantages, then actually 
that you will even fly more. What do we find? Do we find evidence of the consumption effect? Yes, we do find uh, evidence, but only the effect is only sizable for the highest tier level. For lower tier levels, actually the effect is, is, is rather small or even statistically insignificant. Okay, we're not the first ones who focus on uh, frequent fire programs, but I must say there is very, very little evidence. There are, there are very good, uh, impressive studies by uh, Lederman who actually really show that these frequent fire programs have uh, economically important effects on, on the competition and market prices. Yeah, But actually we know very, very little how this works um, within these um, demand. Okay, I get a question here. Uh, if you keep the tire level for the next year, you must fly. Is this really a consumption effect or an incentive effect for those on the higher tire levels? Okay, good question. The question is here, can you really distinguish the, the consumption effect and the incentive effect? Uh, yes, we can. Um, the incentive effect is that you want to fly more for, uh, to, to keep the higher level. So that's what an incentive effect is and the consumption effect is is that you fly more because you have a certain level. But it's right. Uh, I will focus actually on the program for people who move up in the program. But uh, well, um, there's also an effect of not going down. Good question. So what is one of the um, um, hurdles is, of course, the data availability. So we are lucky that we get some good data. OK, so we focus on an airline. I cannot tell you which airline. But it's a large international carrier with a well-established frequent flyer program. And uh, we have data for uh, three years, from 2013 to 2015, and we have roughly a 20% random sample of members. We don't know all, everything that the airline knows, but what do we know? We don't know the individual flights, but we have microdata per month. So for example, we know that someone made three flights in March 2014. And we also know uh, the total mileage, and this is aggregated per month. Okay. The frequent flyer program pro gives award miles to get free flights and qualifying miles. And the qualifying miles is in order to, to give you a higher tire levels. When I talk now about miles in the rest of the presentation, I will only talk about qualifying miles. Yeah, because the award miles are, are, are free flights. We're interested in the tire levels. So what we're going to do, we're going to estimate the effect of tire level within a frequent flyer program um, on members' demand. Okay, I will tell you a little bit about uh, uh, this program, and we have labeled the um, the tire levels uh, um, within the program as ivory, silver, gold, and platinum. So essentially, there are four levels. Of which the, the, the basic one, ivory, is, you, uh, is, is for everyone who uh, registers. And the other one, you know, they give you lounge access, free upgrades, luggage, allowance, etc., etc. And clearly, the platinum gives you much more than the gold. Question, why do low-cost carriers do not concentrate on the FFP? Um, I think, good question. Um, uh, the presentation is not about this. Um, um, Maybe they don't have people who fly enough with them. So if, if, if you never fly more, if you don't make many flights, let's suppose you make only 12 flights a year, then probably it hardly makes any sense. Uh, but maybe they do in the future. And of course, uh, frequent flyer programs also have costs. So it's not completely for free. Good question. OK, members receive a higher level when on the end of the year they exceed a certain flight of mileage threshold. That is actually different for different programs. In some programs, it's only the, the flights or the miles uh, threshold. Most of them have only the miles threshold. But in this program, it's either you need to have a minimum number of flights or a, a min, minimum miles. So for example, you have to make 15 flights a year for uh, maybe silver and maybe 60 or 80 a year for platinum. And with miles, it's more, you have to think about 30,000, 50,000, 80,000, these kind of levels. Okay. So what you should understand is that tire levels are discrete. If you pass a certain threshold, you make at least 15 flights, then you get it. 
while the while uh, the uh, the free miles are continuous. Yeah, so it's really here that's a big uh, important difference. Okay, so we want to uh, identify the incentive effect and the consumption effect. So I want to emphasize again the definition: the incentive effect is that you consume more now in order to qualify for a higher tire level in next period. Or maybe to say differently, uh, uh, as like uh, Volodymyr said, um, you consume now, now to, not to drop down in the program. The consumption effect is that you want to consume more in next period because you have this higher level. Okay. The difficulty is now that the incentive effect means in a technical way that people manipulate their demand in order to reach a higher level. So um, I will explain this more in detail in the, in the coming slide because this is a bit vague, but the, the problem is that the, the, the standard way to identify the consumption effect is only possible if there is no incentive effect. But we deal with that with, the, with a certain trick and I'll explain you in a, in a minute. Okay, let me first talk about the incentive effect. Let's suppose you look at the distribution of flight demand. And usually you would affect a smooth distribution. So maybe uh, there are 1,000 people who make one flight and 600 people who make two flights, etc., etc. It's a smooth distrib distribution. But let's suppose now that you need to have 60 flights in order to uh, get a higher, uh, to get to a higher tier level next year. And now in, in this year, in the end of the year, you only have made 58 flights. Then you know with only making one additional return flight, you have the 60 flights and you get maybe, let's say, platinum. So what you will learn from this, people have an incentive at the end of the year to change their behavior in order to fly more. So if you just look at the distribution, you would see notches in a, in a distribution which would be otherwise smooth. Okay. This is a so-called uh, notch analysis, and you have certain, a test, certain tests for that. It's the so-called McCrary test. It's a very famous test, but there are also some complications. One complication is that flight is a discrete variable. You know, you can count one, two, three, four, five, and the McCrary test is made for smooth, continuous variables like miles. Yeah. So we, we, we uh, um, uh, apply a, a slightly different test, which is the, uh, the Franzen test. No worries about that. I will not uh, bore you with other technicalities. And another problem is, on which we spent months to solve it, and in the end it's very, very easy. Actually, you have even an odd number of flights. And of course, because most people make return flights, even flights are much more common than odd flights. So 10 flights, you see much more frequently in the data than nine flights. Okay, so so and so even if you discard the, the the threshold, you know it's not a, a, a smooth distribution because you have all these spikes. Now the solution is very very simple. It took us a while to come up with it. You actually have separate tests for even and odd distributions. So the even and the odd distributions, we look at them separately. Okay. Now we focus on the consumption effect. The consumption effect is the idea that you get into a higher tire level if the number of flights of mileage of the previous year, so I emphasize of the previous year, exceeds a certain threshold. So to give an example, let us focus on the number of flights. Usually the number of flights in this year, let's suppose in 2014, would be a smooth function of previous number of flights. What do I mean with this? It's very likely that people who tend to fly more last year will also fly more next year. So usually you will see a smooth relationship, a scatter plot. I will show you in a minute lots of scatter plots between number of flights this year and in the previous year. Okay, this previous variable is also called a running variable. But if you now have a threshold, for example, if you um, if you um, exceed a certain threshold, you, you expect actually that this, the function, the relationship is not smooth anymore, but that there is a discrete step. 
I will show you examples of this in a minute. Okay. I get a question here. So here is a question. Um, I don't know how actually um, whether or not airlines adjust the fares. Um, what they, um, I, I think that that is, it might be possible that airlines do that, but that's not, that's not what we are aware of. Um, so what we see more that people in the end of the year, um, uh, in the end of the year, they um, um, maybe change their behavior in order to fly more. So for example, you're a business person and usually you make 50 or 60 uh, flights per year and you, maybe you need this threshold of 60 flights. So at the end of the year, say, wait a minute, I can see that I um, need 60 flights, uh, but I tell my boss, I make one flight more and then you have the 60 flights and then you make it. Maybe airlines at the end of the year adjust their fares, but I don't think they do. It might be. Okay. Back to the consumption effect. The consumption effect that that members who had who just passed the threshold last previous year did receive a tire level. Those who just did not pass the tire uh, threshold did not receive it. So to, to give an example, if I look at people from previous year, there was one someone with 60 flights. So this person got platinum. But there was also someone with 59 flights. The person who just missed the threshold. So the person with 59 flights didn't get platinum, but let's say those only gold, while the person with 60 flights did get a platinum, and so will be treated differently. Now, this is a so-called, allows you to run a so-called regression discontinuity design. And in this regression discontinuity design, what you essentially do, you do a regression of the dependent variable, for example, number of flights, and you regress it on whether or not you have platinum or gold, yeah? So that's uh, whether you're just past the threshold, and then you control, which is called the running variable, for uh, how many flights you made previous year. So you control for 59 or 60, 61 flights, but you can, uh, control for it with the, with the dummy variable. So what is the underlying assumption? If you do statistics, there are always assumptions, and the underlying assumption is that members left and right of the uh, threshold are more or less identical. Okay, this assumption is the so-called non-manipulation assumption. So now I come with the difficulty. The difficulty is that if you have an incentive effect, then this incentive effect implies manipulation. Why is that? If I take someone from, from in my data set who has made 60 flights and I want to compare them to, to 59 flights, it's quite likely that the person who just made 60 flights previous year was someone who was, was really eager to fly. So this person really was eager to have this high terror level and therefore at the end of the year made an effort to, to pass the threshold. While on the other hand, the person who had only 59 flights was realizing that she would not fly so much in the coming year and she didn't bother to make this additional flight. So, it seems, with emphasis on seems, that we cannot apply a regression discontinuity design because members left and right of the threshold can not be treated as similar. I gave this presentation also a couple of years ago, and this was my conclusion in ITA presentation, but since then we have moved on. What is now the new key insight? It took us a year to realize that, that this what we call manipulation of the running variable, so the incentive effects, occurs at the, at the end of the year. Think about it. If you are in December, you realize that you, that you, um, that you uh, may fly more, that you want to fly more next year. So you want to say, okay, I have 58, I have 58 uh, flights. You know what I will do? I make an additional flight. But if you go early in the year, maybe in November or even in October, people say, I don't know what happens in the future, I just continue. So someone, for example, in November who has 
58 flights will not manipulate because he or she expects in December to make more flights. So the essential idea is, and this is also called with a more difficult name, a fuzzy regression discontinuity design. We don't, we don't measure whether people um, exceeded the threshold in December last year, which gave them the uh, opportunity to uh, the, uh, give them the offer of a higher tire level. We look at earlier months. Now, is this not completely clear? Does it, uh, for the, to interpret the result, it doesn't matter so much, but I just want to say we look as a running variable, not in December of previous year, how many miles or flies you had, but in November. And if, if you look in November, then you get all the uh, nice uh, statistical properties you will require in this, um, in this uh, statistical analysis. Okay. Just to say one thing more, and then I'm going to show you more results, because I think people are more interested in results than maybe in the, uh, in the presentation, uh, than in the methodology, that a fuzzy regression discontinuity design is actually a combination of a regression discontinuity design and an instrumental variable approach. Inst instrumental variable approach here means that you have a dummy indicator whether a member exceeds the threshold in November of previous year. Most of you will be familiar with an instrumental variable approach, and you will be aware that there's always one important condition. The instrument must be strong. It must be have enough power. So I will also show you some graphs to show you how can you easily see whether these um, uh, instruments have enough power. Okay, I lost here the, the, the question, so I have to, um, okay. Okay, there are also a, a number of uh, complications. One complication is that we have two running variables. Okay, another question by uh, Volodymyr. Is it in the, okay. Um, a good question. The question here by Volimir, um, is it, do you must uh, exceed the threshold uh, uh, in November or is earlier also okay? Earlier is also okay. So uh, some of them have already passed it in March, some in June, but we check whether or not you have passed the threshold in November. Good question. Thank you. A few other complications, but these are technical stuff, so I will not spend too much time on it. First of all, we have two running variables. And for those of you who are familiar with the regression, this continuity design, probably are more familiar with one running variable. The solution will be also a fuzzy regression, this continuity design. And the other problem is, uh, is that members during the year may receive higher levels. So not only at the end of the year, but maybe you pass this threshold already in November or maybe in October. Also, this can be solved with the fuzzy regression, this continuity design. If up to now things are not clear, if we in a minute we'll show the, the, the graphs, things will be clear on this. Okay. Another thing is, and that's with the consumption effect, and this may be uh, also what Volodymyr was uh, uh, referring to, um, um, people, members may move up and down in, in, in the program. And um, uh, what we do now, Actually, we only look up. We will look at people who move up in the program. The reason is that the programs, and like this program, has been designed that actually the consumption effect is smaller if you move down than you move up. Now, uh, why is that? Um, now, I think that makes sense within a program that if you lose your platinum, that you then you don't want to give an incentive to the uh, uh, member. To, to, to reduce uh, to fly. So when they move up, you want to, to stimulate them to fly more, to say, hey, you get your if you get platinum, please fly more. But of, of, but of course, at the moment, you take away this uh, tire level because you don't fly enough. You don't, you don't want to induce that this person even fly uh, 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 even, even less than before. So we only look now at people who are moving up in the program. Okay, let's start with some simple uh, histograms. 
Maybe you cannot see them very well, but I want to emphasize here that this is a log. So it's a log frequency of flights, and we show you flights up to 100 flights, and we also show the miles up to 100,000. And what you can see, actually, uh, because it's in logs, uh, you know, most people actually make only zero or one or two flights, very, very few flights. Okay. On the left hand side, you see the flights, and you also see that you know you have odd and even flights. So it's 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 uh, so here we mix them still, and here are, are indicated these three lines are actually the thresholds. On the right hand side, uh, we have miles, and we have accidentally have uh, six uh, thresholds because actually the thresholds differ by uh, by country group, but we focus only on one country group. So actually, this should have been three lines. So you can also already see if you go to the uh, left uh, diagram that if you look around the 60 flights and around the what is it uh, 30 flights, you see actually the frequency is higher, suggesting there is an incentive effect. Because remember the uh, incentive effect you can just see based on the frequency distribution. In a minute we we'll show you more detailed um, data. Okay, maybe to tell a little bit how. Do you get into a higher program, a higher tire level, through zip, through flights or miles or both? And what we see to get into for silver, around 52% manages to get silver through flights, and 34% uh, through miles, and 30% pass both thresholds. And this is conditional on having reached silver. But for example, if you look at platinum, conditional on reaching platinum in this program. Um, uh, Hardly anyone um, gets, uh, into, uh, gets platinum just on flights. Now, I can tell you also why. I think you need to have uh, 60 single flights per year, which is rather a lot. I think you fly more than once a week. But with uh, miles, if you make uh, uh, many uh, long distance miles, actually, then you can easily get these uh, uh, platinum. So it shows you that the program in this program has been designed that for platinum is mainly people who uh, um, fly a lot based on miles, but not so in terms of flights. Okay, I hope you can see this. What we're going to do, we're going to look at samples around thresholds. So these are people who have around the silver thresholds. So for example, we have 50,000 uh, um, people around roughly 50,000 observations around the miles threshold and 100,000 around the flight threshold. Um, on average, in, um, yeah, what shall I say more about this? Um, we also take into account uh, carryover qualifying miles, but in this program, if you have around silver, there are no uh, carryover qualifying miles. Okay. Here we have the, 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 um, uh, the, the sample around the gold. Now you see the annual flight is roughly 14, with flights is 21, so it's more, and we have now around 10 to 20,000 observations. And we, when we focus on platinum, so these people will fly really a lot, we have roughly 10,000 around the threshold miles and only 6,000 around the flight uh, miles. And you see, for example, that these persons make on average around 40 flights. Okay, diagrams. Let's start with platinum. Let's focus on the right hand side, and then we have standardized, so zero is the threshold. Now, if you look at this, and these are only the uh, uh, even number of observations. So, uh, why would we do only do that? Because otherwise, you would have this uh, the diff difficulty of not seeing the difference between odd and even. The odd pictures look similar to the even, but it's nicer to look at them separately. But you clearly can see that, that the probability of making 58 flights is much lower than the probability of making 60 flights. Recall that this is in logarithms. So actually, it's roughly, I don't know, it's um, almost uh, one log. So maybe it's around, I don't know, 70% less. So you're 70% less likely to have 58 flights than 60 flights. This is in December. Now we look at November, and then you really don't see this, this, this notch. Okay, there's a question by Wayne. Have you noticed that carriers globally have moved away from this sort of program threshold? 
EEI not on actual flight, but re-engineered to make it fair from premium passengers over economy class? Ah, it's a good question by um, Wayne. Actually, that's true. Um, there, are, there are movements over um, frequent flyer programs change all the time. Um, actually, when I talk about flights, it's really about flights. But when I talk about miles, actually, this is actually also more a mixture of um, expenditure and miles, but the program we focus on now, this carrier actually have moved to real miles. So um, I, I think that these, all these airlines compete with each other and over time they have to find out which program works best. You may actually also ask, um, because we, we do this data with all kinds of results, do the, do the airlines, do, not, do they know this consumption effect? Do they know this incentive effect? I think talking to these programs, actually they have a vague feeling what is going on. They don't have control for it, but also most importantly, if you set up a program and uh, it, takes you, it takes time um, uh, to get used to it. So if after a couple of years you want to change it, it's quite costly. So I think it's a slowly evolving process where uh, airlines try to maximize their profits. Okay. Back to November, in November you don't see a notch. In other words, people manipulate in December, they fly more in December to just pass the, the, the threshold, but not in November. Clear evidence of manipulation in the end of the year. Now we look at gold. Okay, we go back. Akim has a question. Um, there seems to be a spike at plus six. Uh, actually, it is more. It is actually plus plus ten. Okay. I think this is actually a, a small sample problem. We don't have too many day, uh, observations anymore. You will see later on that that the other uh, uh, distributions are more smooth. In this sense, in November we had not too many observations, as therefore, especially because it's it's in logs. Don't forget. So it means that uh, going from sixty to maybe to uh, 80 flights, the number of uh, observations is reduced maybe by a factor of five. Okay, now we look at gold. You see already that the, the graphs are much more smooth. And again, in December, you see people manipulating. I think here you need to have 40, uh, 40 flights. So again, 38 flights is maybe have a log. So it's maybe 50%, you're less likely to, uh, uh, to um, to fly in, uh, to make 58 flights in, in December than 60 flights, sorry, 38 than 40 flights. But if you look at November, we don't see any manipulation, a rather smooth graph. Now we go to uh, silver. Um, in December, there might be a little bit of, um, uh, of, of, um, of manipulation. Uh, but uh, in November there's nothing, and also our test suggests there's a little bit of manipulation with flights, but it's not it's not very extreme as you can see. Similar. Now we focus on on, on miles. We start again with 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 uh, with uh, platinum. If you look at the right hand side, yes, there seems to be manipulation. You see that there is, that there is a notch, but if you look in November, no evidence of a notch. If you look in, in gold, right, probably there is some manipulation going on because uh, it, it's not going down really what you expect. Well, in November, there is no, uh, there is no notch. Silver, um, I think I only have here the, the miles here. And uh, why is it there is already here no notch? So I didn't show you November, but that's also no notch. Okay, to, to conclude on the incentive effect, it seems to be that many members manipulate at all thresholds except for silver mileage. So in other words, uh, these people really change their behavior at the end of the year in order to, um, to uh, get uh, a higher tire level. Actually, if you look, and that's the question uh, by Volodymyr, to what extent people also try to avoid moving down. Actually, this effect is even stronger. So in that sense, here I show you underestimates. If we do this uh, with the formal test, actually, then this is supported uh, uh, our conclusion based on uh, graphs. 
Okay, what does it mean? This is technical that actually we can use November as an instrument for in our vision regression design. Okay, remember that an instrument needs to be strong. What does it mean it needs to, an instrument needs to be strong? That means that just passing the threshold in November must be a strong predictor of, um, of um, um, having a tire level uh, next year. Right? What does it mean? For example, here, can you show this graph? People who have flown a little bit in November uh, less miles. So, for example, this is in thousands. So they they fly um, uh, maybe uh, uh, two thousand uh, five hundred less than the threshold. They still have a twenty percent chance of of um, of passing the threshold in December, but in November they still have not. Okay, here's this a question by Asham. Do travelers increase their desire to travel more to get upgraded next year? Or do they switch from other airline or even other transportation methods? Um, good question, very important question. Maybe I should emphasize this. We only focus on uh, one airline, so uh, we don't know where the demand comes from. Uh, we can hypothesize about this. They can either fly more uh, or they get their demand from uh, competitors. Um, my hunch is that the incentive effect is coming from uh, um, uh, is really additional demand. It, it's really that you make an additional flight at the last moment. So it, it can go maybe at the, at the cost of other uh, competitors, but uh, it's less likely. The consumption effect, I think, actually is really from the um, competitive. But this is just my guesswork because, in principle, we cannot distinguish between those explanations. Thank you. Very good question. So what you can he see here clearly, there is a discrete jump around zero with the probability of uh, passing the uh, threshold. In other words, the instrument is strong. So you can see, for example, if in November you just passed the, uh, uh, the threshold, then of course you're certain to pass the threshold in November, but people who are just below, they have a 50% chance of not making it. So someone, for example, who was 1,000 miles below the threshold in November uh, has a 50% chance of making it in December, but also 50% of not making it. Okay. If we look to so the discrete jumps in uh, of the flights, then we see also this is actually roughly 45%. So again, a discrete, large discrete jump. If we look at gold, similar is roughly 50%. But if we look at flights, is already becoming roughly 15%. It's already small, so the instrument is not very strong. So that means that that with round flights for gold, we cannot actually uh, do our uh, um, our consumption effect because the instrument is too weak. We can only rely on the mileage threshold. If we look now at uh, platinum. If we look around the miles, we see it's roughly maybe 50%, so that, that's really a discrete uh, difference. But if we look at flights, actually, there is no prediction at all. In other words, if you have, uh, in November, you have ha had uh, these uh, 58 flights or 59 flights, you know, you always, literally always make 60 flights in December. So here we don't have enough power to go on. Okay, I think this is, let's hurry up a little bit. This is clear, this is summarizing what I'm saying. So this is the meat on the bone, because this is maybe what you're interested in. Do we see any effect of uh, flying on the consumption effect? To interpret this uh, graph, maybe let's go to a graph where it's, the, 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 the effect is very, very clear, and then I come back to the previous graph. Look at platinum, please, on the right-hand side. And the zero is, again, the threshold. So on the on the on the x axis you see the, the the number of miles you made last year in November. And what you see, if you made more flights in last year in November, you're more likely to actually uh, make more flights this year. So this is an upward sloping graph, and we have uh, um, 
with the line we indicate the regression line. But at the moment you just pass the threshold, then you see an indiscreet jump. And then we also have, have this regression line. So this clearly shows that people who just pass the threshold, and presumably are similar to people who just did not pass the threshold, they behave differently. They make more flights. And if you look at this difference, actually is roughly two flights. Okay, is this then the overall effect? No, For, don't forget that roughly 50% of the people um, made the flight on miles and the other ones made it actually in, uh, uh, made it anyway. So actually you have to roughly double this with a factor of two. So this, um, this uh, graph uh, suggests that uh, platinum uh, in, uh, increased their number of flights with roughly four, maybe even five uh, flights. If we look at gold, you see maybe something going on, but it's not very obvious. If we go back to silver, and with silver we can look at miles and flights, we see with miles we see something going on, but it's not very, very, very clear. And with flights we see something very, very going on, but it's also not extremely clear. Achim asked, platinum much more noisy on the right hand side. We're going to look. Yes. Why is there a so is, is platinum much more noisy on the right hand side? Sorry, I have to go back. The reason is, is that we have less data there. Again, remember that there is a, a, a the histogram of uh, for miles was in a, in a logarithm was downward sloping, so the number of observations uh, in plus ten thousand compared to minus ten thousand is maybe is a difference of twenty thousand, but maybe there are five times as many observations on the left hand side than on the right hand side. So the variance is much larger and therefore much noisier. And uh, I think the implication is by the question by Akim, and uh, uh, is that the graph would be more convincing if on the right hand side it would also be a very, very clear graph, because uh, a very, very sharp line with less, with less scatter. The, le the less scatter there is in the graph, the more convincing. So if we go now, for example, to the left, here there is, there is, there is you see there is also. Um, uh, uh, less scatter, and therefore it's more obvious where the uh, regression line is. Okay. So let me summarize the results. If we do, because we do all kind of analysis with Poisson models and regression models, but actually they tell more or less the same story as all these graphs. So let me summarize it. With silver, we have two thresholds, just passing the flight and the miles threshold. And we file, find that actually people make uh, roughly uh, a little bit more than one, fl one additional flight. And this means is roughly 18%. So people, they make roughly 18% more flights. With mileage, we find a, a weaker result. We find roughly 320 miles. So it's only 12%. So these are actually also, I think, in, 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 in absolute terms, one flight, 300 miles, which is a short, is one way, is one short flight. These are not uh, huge numbers. And also in, in terms of percentage, 12, 80%, it's, it's, it's not negligible, but it's not a huge number. What do we find for uh, the uh, mileage threshold of, for silver? We find actually positive effects, but they're not statistically significant. If we look at Gold, also positive, positive effect, but not statistical significant. We do all kind of robustness checks, we're still working on that, but essentially what we find, sometimes it's significant, sometimes it's not, but we always find positive signs. So we, we, our interpretation is, yes, there is an effect, but it's very difficult to uh, identify and to really point out how strong the effect is. But not in the end, when we focus on platinum, there the effects are the more, most pronounced. We find that people make roughly five, five to eight flights more, which is roughly 30 to uh, uh, 50 percent. And for mileage, we find uh, weaker results, but they're not statistically significant. Okay, 
So what does it suggest? It seems that the effect is more pronounced for flights than for miles. But maybe this may be an, a statistical artifact. I also think maybe that with flights, it's easier to measure. Miles is also here a construction of the real miles and the uh, um, uh, type of ticket you have bought. So, um, so we're quite sure there is a strong uh, flight behavior effect with platinum, probably also uh, a small but not negligible effect uh, around silver. In other words, people start to fly more because they have platinum. For gold, there's not really very convincing evidence, but we think there's something there. And for silver, there is a, is a, there is a statistical significant effect, but it's in, in terms of size, it's weak. It's only one flight. Okay. So what do we learn from this? Okay, we know that uh, travelers are uh, price sensitive, but um, at the moment you get platinum, all these additional benefits like a free lounge and upgrades makes you to fly more with the airline and actually is five to eight flights. Um, so that it's a uh, rather strong effect. And I also would like to emphasize that the effect for platinum is on top of having silver and gold. So if I say five to eight flights, you should add the one flight by silver and maybe a positive effects of gold as well. Here a question by uh, Benny. There's also another option for frequent flyers. They can buy miles to qualify. No, actually, yes. But actually in this program, when we're investigating, you were not able to buy, my, to buy qualifying miles. So you could buy award miles, uh, but not qualifying miles. So here that didn't play any role. Good question, because otherwise this is another form of manipulation. Um, having said that, um, if even if it would be possible, probably people would have bought these miles in December and probably not in November. So even if that would be the case, our uh, analysis probably would still be, be valid because only in December it's 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 um, it's you you realize you just missed two, two maybe thousand miles and you will buy them. Okay, now I think I get to, to my uh, last slide. Ah, Kun Wang said, could we quantify the incentive effect through some regression approaches? Um, good question. That's actually how we started. So if you uh, had seen my presentation three years ago, we used regression approaches, but then um, later on we discovered, we, we used uh, regression approaches because we mixed the, the odd and the even distributions. And then while, I was looking through the, while we were looking through the literature, we discovered actually that if you do the odd and the even distributions uh, separately, actually you uh, can just do it based on the distributions. So yes, uh, you can do it with uh, regression approaches, but they are um, less convincing and not uh, than just looking at the distributions. And that's also how the literature uh, measures on, on notches. So essentially it's just a non-parametric non approach. To conclude, I drink some water here. To conclude, a member strongly increases demand in order to reach a higher tire level. Um, and then we use the trick of, of manipulation before December, so only in, in November. And uh, we also find evidence of the consumption effect, particularly for platinum. And I would like to emphasize here, we, we focus on people moving up in the program. The incentive effect is at least as strong for those moving down, so people, um, that's absolutely there. For the consumption effect, we believe there's no consumption effect of the people moving down. Okay, there's here a, a question by Nicholas. May I ask what about the airline and its partnership? Is it still the same, similar? Uh, yes, uh, it's, 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 it's the same. Um, uh, yes, okay, that's a good point. You, you can you, you earn your questions, if I understand well, through the whole program. But when we look at the flight behavior, we only look at the flight behavior uh, with the main carrier. But maybe Chris and, and, and or Herman may correct me. 
uh, I'm sure that the, the miles and the flights are from the program, but in terms of their dependent variable, now I start to wonder if it's only from the main carrier or from all carriers together. I think it's only from the main carrier. And the main carrier is a combination of two airlines which fly um, two international uh, um, uh, carriers. Okay. Other questions? Sorry, Good both the, the Nick, Nicole, both Nick, the Nicole Adler asks, in the age of climate change, should airlines be forced to drop the FFP in light of your results? Uh, I think it's... Um, um, probably yes, they reduce competition. And actually, I didn't emphasize it too much, um, but uh, there is a literature that uh, most people who fly for business get their miles or their free flights through work, but they spend them privately. So uh, anyway, I think in an ideal world, um, uh, mileage, free miles, and all these uh, bonus points you earn through lo loyalty programs should be taxed as income. So, um, uh, and actually all these programs are also anti-competitive. Yes, good question. Question by uh, Shuli. How do you think if we introduce loyalty programs in rail sector, in particular high school in China, how will it affect the passengers' preferences? Um, I think um, I think in the hotel sector, of course, you have already have uh, loyalty programs. Um, I think also in Europe, I think some airline, sorry, some uh, rail railway companies also have loyalty programs. So I can imagine that they also in in China would like their loyalty programs. Um, I don't know if that's a good idea. I don't think it's good for welfare. But it's, 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 it's maybe a way of how uh, companies uh, compete with each other. Benny has again a question. Uh, do we have the right level of tires? Now, that's a brilliant question. That's a very, because the question of Benny is saying, is the number of tires, is that optimal? Um, the real question is, we need more theory about it to, to know the answer. I think the fact that you have this incentive effect, and this incentive effect is, is, is local. What do I mean with local? If you have 58 flights, you try to get 60 flights. But if you have 55 flights, maybe you don't bother because it's impossible to get to 60 flights. So from that perspective, it seems to having more uh, 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 tire levels is better. But of course, if you have too many tire levels, it becomes continuous. And if it's continuous, we have seen again that um, 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 uh, like with, with, with the free miles, it doesn't work. So you, I think you can have more um, can have more tire levels, but actually the, the, the benefits they, they give must be uh, convex. So they must give more and more benefits. So you cannot have a concave function of benefits. It must be a convex function of benefits. And that's where you also see in these programs it's the, the, the benefits of silver are only almost negligible, while those of platinum are really substantial. Vladimir Aguen, the question. Do you have more recent data? Um, no. Um, uh, we would love to have them, because we hope, actually, they change their program to compare uh, the program before and after. But I think this is, during the corona time, this is not the time to go to airlines and ask for more data. Uh, about this, I think they're very busy with other things. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, this airline and also other airlines get support from the government, so um, uh, they um, might be also more willing to share data to 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 the research community. Okay, Hong Yi, nice to see you. Okay. Um, how should I give uh, advice uh, to airlines? And how should the carrier involve their frequent flyer program? Um, I must say, actually, how he actually worked also with her master thesis on, on, uh, on, on this data. And then we asked her to do something which in the end was impossible to do. So apologies to Hong Yi here. 
Um, um, the advice to airlines would be actually that these tire programs really work. Um, when we started working on this, the, 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 the loyalty program management told us we don't care if the consumption effect exists, we don't care if the incentive effect exists, because we make money with, uh, based on the credit cards. But on the other hand, when we told them that the incentive effect exists and the consumption effect existed, they were very happy with this because uh, you can see that within a larger program, the managers of the frequent flyer program have their own unit. And of course, within organizations, um, uh, departments fight for, I would say, money and attention from the CEO. So uh, if the, the, the management of the loyalty program goes to the CEO and says, wait a minute, it works, you know, there's an incentive effect, there's a consumption effect, we make money on the credit cards, they were very, very happy. Okay. But now the question is, how could we advise them? Um, the question is, do you need more tier levels? I wonder, um, because you, what is important that the benefits should, should, should be convex. So it's, it's very difficult to, to have something more than platinum. It's something in between, it becomes more continuous. So I think actually uh, the airline does uh, um, uh, pretty well, um, but um, uh, this is a very difficult question. How should airlines improve? Um, the real answer is probably, um, I don't know, probably. Good question. Thank you. Okay, it's five minutes after 12. Um, are there any more questions? I don't see any more questions coming in. Okay, Volumi has a question. Does the airline need silver level based on your results? Um, not really, maybe a little bit. And uh, of course, it's a stepping stone. And we find some results. Actually, we find strong incentive. No, we don't find strong incentive. We find actually for people moving back from silver to uh, uh, ivory, which I didn't show, we find uh, more effects for, for incentive effect. So do they need silver? Um, it helps. But on the other hand, the, the, the program we focus on, a couple of years ago, silver meant a little bit. But now the only thing you get with silver is, I think, um, uh, uh, one free uh, luggage. So, for example, I have silver with the program, but I never have a lot of luggage because I fly within Europe. So for me, the, the benefits of having silver are um, negligible. So I would not manipulate at the end of the year to get uh, uh, to silver. Uh, but with other, for other people, it might be they still need silver, probably. So um, I would not abolish it, but um, I think like the airline did, to hardly give any benefits is probably, um, is probably uh, is good. It's probably good, uh, good for the airline, not good for the world. Okay, Gerben just added um, uh, that also the cost of having silver are very, very low. And maybe, yeah, maybe that's uh, good, uh, very good that uh, Gerben emphasized this. Lots of benefits given within these programs are very are, are are benefits which do not have monetary costs to, to the airline. For example, if if I can go first in the line when I, while while checking in, uh, there's always an order of people who arrive, so there is no money involved there. If I give you an upgrade because there's an empty seat, uh, of course this could have been sold. But there is no, uh, there is no um, money, uh, there is no cost there for the company explicitly, except for the opportunity cost of, of not trying to sell it. So many of the things given to uh, frequent fire travelers, uh, um, so very often, I think the, the, the actual costs are limited for the program, uh, uh, especially nowadays because of the everything can, the administrative costs are very, very small. Don't forget that in the past, administrative costs were huge. Wayne also has a question. Wayne says it would be negligible when you look from good, but from ivory it may be substantial. 
Um, oh, from gold, yeah, okay, of course. From ivory, it may be substantial. Yes, um, yeah, I understand gold, yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, um, it may be substantial for some people, but I think nowadays it, 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 it's not so much. It's not so much. Uh, I had silver for lots of, uh, lots of years with this program, and um, it didn't get, you know, hardly get priority, you don't get advantage anymore in, in lines. Uh, um, yes, but it, it gives some benefits, definitely. Good point. How could you explain the finding that there is no consumption effect for gold tire? Is there something special for this tire? Um, good question. Uh, um, I don't know. It might be just a, a, a statistical artifact that we don't have enough observations. With gold, we do not have so, so many observations as with uh, silver. And probably the effect is, 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 is uh, therefore weaker. Um, I think what, what happens is that the additional benefits of gold relative to silver are not huge. They're huge from platinum to gold. Um, um, but um, from gold to silver, they are not huge. Uh, my, my feeling is there is just an effect, but we cannot show it. If the airline, Nicholas has another question. If the airline allow passengers who are close to the targeted tear to pay certain money to meet the tear, will the incentive effect be different? Ah, okay. So Nicholas asks you, is it why don't you allow them to pay? Um, I, I think actually. Um, that might be a good idea uh, because making this additional flight is um, yeah yeah I have to think about this might this be a good idea um, the consumption effect will not be different I don't think the way we estimate it but the the the, the, the incentive effect will be uh, will be will definitely be uh, different because if you can get Hmm. Yes, I, I'm not sure if it's a good idea to do. I um, it's it's buying yourself into the tear level. Um, I would not be amazed that there, that, that that that's optimal. That is better for the for the for the company to offer also give also a financial incentive. But I don't know. Yeah, good question. Too difficult. <laughs> Okay, this was uh, another question by Akim. Okay, okay, it was a thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And um, it was strange giving a presentation without hearing anything. But um, goodbye, everyone, and uh, enjoy your uh, Corona time at home. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, let me uh, just uh, thank you very much, uh, yours. I, I, Everyone could see that it was a great presentation because there were so many questions. Uh, so thank you very much for this. You can't hear me right now, but uh, anyway, I want to thank you. Uh, you can see me. And uh, I would like to um, everyone to invite uh, you to the uh, next presentation by Jan Bruckner on uh, Thursday. And uh, so day after tomorrow. And uh, so I hope that uh, you will all join again. And uh, so we virtually clap hands for yours. It was a great presentation. And we stop the recording right now and hope to see you soon again. Okay, thank you and bye-bye.